them so that they can recognize each other and, and to make port scanning for Freenet nodes more difficult. But how, this is, so this is basically a block of to most people unint unintelligible data that they need to exchange with each other and then somehow tell their Freenet nodes about. How do we make that happen in as painless a way as possible? Do, do we encourage people to send it by email and then cut and paste? Or how do we do that? And that's, you know, that's one of the usability challenges we're looking at. So can, can it be done by phone? Well, it'll be a long and rather dull phone conversation, but in theory. Um, or can you rely on a, on a trusted third party? From a usability perspective, that's actually by far the easiest way to facilitate this if there's a third party that can be trusted. But of course, that creates exactly the kind of centralization that, that we hope to avoid in, in Freenet and in most uh, anonymity preserving software. Also, what about, what about NATs and firewalls? Now, these things are a nightmare for peer-to-peer. -peer. A computer behind a NAT or a firewall is, is, is essentially like a telephone that can only really make outgoing calls. Um, fortunately, the way firewalls are, are implemented, there are ways that you can get around this problem uh, by using certain characteristics of how firewalls handle UDP. Now that, so that's, that's not really a hack. We're, we're not doing anything that causes a firewall to do anything that a firewall doesn't want to do. A firewall wants to prevent connections from people that you don't want to talk to. But using uh, UDP NAT circumvention, the only way you can end up talking to somebody is if you essentially want to talk to them. Um, so this is, not a, this is not a security risk, even though we are kind of circumventing um, what NATs try to do. So this is the technique that's used by Digger, which is another piece of software of mine, and Skype, which um, many of you will probably be familiar with, a very popular voice over IP application. In fact, a voice over IP application that I think a lot of its, its success comes from its use of this technique, because in my experience, certainly with, with voice over IP software, one of the biggest problems is you have to go in and reconfigure a firewall, and it's, it's just a mess. Um, the, issue, the issue with NAT circumvention is that it does require a third party in order to negotiate this direct connection, but that third party can be you know, pretty much anyone in the network that's not behind a NAT or a firewall. So it doesn't need to be a single centralized third party. It can be anyone else in the network. Okay, so uh, in conclusion, I think we'll, we'll have some time for questions. Um, we believe it's, it's possible to do what we're trying to do, and we are, we are doing it. We're well underway to implementing this. You can go to uh, freenetproject.org. Uh, all our source code is, is uh, or most of our source code is under the GPL. It's all under a free software license. Um, and you know we're we're very keen. If if you're particularly if you're a Java hacker, this is all written in Java, and you're interested in being part of this, you know, stop, check out our website, find our IRC channel. It's hash Freenet on Freenode. Um, say hi, and if you're actually willing to willing and able to contribute and you get your teeth into something, it's 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 very easy to to uh, start working on this stuff. We're not a, we're not a very exclusive organization. We, we welcome anyone that's willing to help. Um, but going, going back to the theory of this, there, there is still work to do on the theory. The algorithm we've described, uh, we know it works in simulation. Evidence suggests that it works on small world networks with our ORCID tests. But we don't know that it's the best possible algorithm. There may be uh, much more, much faster, much more efficient, much more robust ways to do this. Um, you know, and that is an ongoing uh, topic of, of research for us. Um, can we can we find better ways to choose peers to switch? Right, right now, uh, when we're deciding whether or not two peers should switch. Uh, 
they're just chosen at random. Maybe there's a better way that we could choose two peers to see whether they should switch than simply choosing them at random. And of course, we need to test it on, we need to test it on more data. Um, practice is always more difficult than theory. Uh, this is something we've learned very much the hard way over the past five years. And uh, in the next version of Freenet, Freenet 0 0.7, which will incorporate what we've been talking about here, um, we've really tried to apply a lot of the lessons to avoid a lot of the mistakes that, that we've made in, in the past. But still, you know, I'm sure we're going to discover a whole new set of mistakes that we've made. So you can never underestimate the uh, difficulty of actually implementing something, particularly peer-to-peer -peer networks. Um, okay, so as I said, that's our, that's our website. Check it out. There's a lot of information on there. Uh, join our mailing list, join our RRC channel, um, and uh, you can uh, help us out, hopefully. So I think, I think we may have a few minutes for, for some questions. Yeah. Okay, um, so at the moment you're using a flat 2D coordinate system, but that's an entirely arbitrary choice in this case. You could use three dimensions, four dimensions, or you could use 2D on a sphere. Have you experimented with any, any other coordinate systems? Well, well, actually, actually the 2D thing was we did it now in order to make it visually appealing. In fact, what we're using is a one-dimensional system where we place everyone in a ring. That, tends, that seems to be the one that... Uh, most computationally feasible. And we've run simulations both on the social network data, the, the thing that we showed, and also there are other social network data we can use, like the PGP set and stuff like that, to try to see which one of these seems to be the best. And it seems to be that they were actually, is it, it, one dimensions, two dimensions seems to work about the same. Then you start going to three dimensions and stuff. It doesn't work as well. Probably more to do with uh, the problem being more computationally difficult than it's the data fitting worse. So there's sort of, so, but it's a very good question sort of, and that's what we meant when we said there could other models work better. The question is what should you be fitting against? And who knows what the real world looks like? It probably isn't a flat two-dimensional grid. It probably isn't a three-dimensional thing either. It's something very complicated. What we really just need is something that works good enough. And in fact, it seems that a circle is actually good enough. So. Cool, thanks. Um, you're building this network of friends. But what I don't understand is, at the end of the day, if there's a direct con connection between two nodes when they're trying to exchange a file, how will that be useful in concealing that you're using the network? That's, that's, that's a good question. So, there, okay, so it doesn't create a direct connection between peers that are exchanging files. Rather, the file is transmitted along a path, um, along the path that the request took. Okay. So, really, you need the friends you're connected with, they, they shouldn't be firewalled because you said circumvention of, of firewalling is a, is a problem. Um, but as long as you're connected to nodes that well, along the path, I, su I suppose you need you don't you, you need it to be as least firewalled as possible because it will have to go at least six steps to any other node in, in your network, and if there's a, a blockage on the way, you won't get the file. Is that correct? Right. I mean, well, there could be more than one path, so it's a robust system. So you tend to, but but of course, the point is. We all know if a firewalls are a problem for peer-to-peer -peer software. Wherever you have two peers who try to talk to each other, if they're both behind firewalls, then you get problems and you end up having to use these sort of hole-punching techniques. So, in a way, these systems are more firewall-friendly than the old type of peer-to-peer -peer systems because you know who you're talking to. So, if you have 10 friends that you trust, those are the ones you're going to be sending packets to, and you can keep a sustained connection to them the whole time. Whereas in old peer to peer systems, the kind of open ones, you get connections going all over the place. So, in that sense, this thing is, is more firewall friendly. But on the other hand, if you, we, we really need people 
if, if two people are trusted friends, they really need to be able to talk. Because if half the trusted friends can't talk, then this will not work. That's why we worry about firewalls. When it's Thank you. Any other questions? Um, let's say uh, someone uh, on the upper left wants to talk to someone on the lo lower right. So there's this chain and uh, person A sends to B, sends to C, until eventually it uh, arrives at the destination. And uh, I suppose all that is encrypted because all peer traffic is encrypted. But uh, does every peer along the way decode the packet and re-encode it? Or how do two people which are more than one hop away uh, establish uh, com uh, secure communication? So, so it is link level secure communication. So yes, every peer along the way decrypts the request, which they need to do because they need to figure out where to route it next. And then they will re-encrypt the request. There, there is other crypto going on. The, the request is, is encrypted before it's even sent into the network. And what, what you're actually trying to find in Freenet is, not, is the hash of the key that you're looking for. So it makes it not impossible, because it's still vulnerable to a dictionary attack, but it makes it a lot more difficult for intermediate nodes to know what data is actually being requested. So the, the key of the data and the data itself is encrypted between the person who actually inserted the data and the person who's requesting it. And only the person, the originator of the request, can decrypt the data. Um, this is a thing which we call a, a SSKs, and I, unfortunately, I'm not sure there's going to be time to explain exactly how it works. But there's kind of two layers of encryption, link level and then this higher layer. So there would always be link level and end-to-end -end encryption on these sort of things. That would be. Okay, but um, does this uh, usage of social network is isn't this a problem in creating uh, profiles? I mean, um, you want to to uh, hide this information, usually who talks to whom and who knows whom, and you're, you're actually uh, encouraging this. So often someone is only interested in who knows whom. For example, um, if I'm a, a resistance uh, guy in China and um, my seven friends are also in the resistance movement, it's very easy to track me and my friends, isn't it? Well, if Certainly, if one person can be can be identified, then you know, and they're actually going to break into their home and you know look at their computer or do a detailed study of their internet connection. Yes, the well, yes and no. I mean, the chances are that there'll be much easier ways under those circumstances for, let's say, the Chinese government to determine who who your friends are. But our goal is actually to prevent it from getting to that stage, to prevent so that using this system, there's no easy way for somebody to determine that you're part of this system. Once, so once they are looking at you and willing to expend manpower specifically uh, to attack your anonymity, you have much bigger problems, I would say, because they can break into your home when you're not there. They can bug your keyboard and all sorts of things. Our goal is, is to prevent it from getting to that stage. There, there are limits on, on how much you can protect against in practice. There's no software we could write which could help people in North Korea, sort of. I mean, there's some point. So what you're looking at is rather this sort of thing is with current peer-to-peer -peer systems, with current free net, well, you have, if somebody uh, you can just join the network and start harvesting, finding out people who are in there and start attacking them. And people might have heard that this has been going on with some file sharing networks. So whereas with this sort of network, you would really have to use a technique where you can't just come in and get lots of people. You really have to try harder. So, and all you can really expect to do is make it harder for people. So that's a, But on the other hand, there, of course, there is a trade-off that with this darknet, you're really showing who knows who. And even to somebody in the... Like there's been questions about these identifiers we're assigning. Maybe they tell like, wow, he belongs with the resistance because his identifier is around, you know. So th th there is a legitimate question about that. But this is the way you kind of have to do it if you want to route in one of these networks. Um, a question, what about 
agents that infiltrate the, uh, the net of trust.